get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Wise here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, like the founders of P90X, Tony Horton. Um, you know, David, what's interesting is he talked about, yes, he's sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X, but what he talked about was he used to make money as a street mime. So he would put his hat on the street and the money he made would pay for his apartment and his food. And that's initially how he made money to live. Um, Baby Einstein founder, Julie Clark, grew her company in a short time to $20 million um, and sold to Disney. But the impressive part was she beat cancer twice. She calls herself the cancer assassin. And Atari founder, Nolan Bushnell, talked about when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered Nolan 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. And there's many more stories. Um, so check out inspiredinsider.com for more episodes. Um, the sponsor in episode uh, is brought to you today by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and clients. And we do that through our Done For You podcast solution, which is like a Swiss army knife for your business. So it serves as a vehicle for strategic partnerships, referral marketing, content marketing. I even met my business partner and some of my best friends. David Long and I are in a group together with Brian Kurtz, and I met Brian Kurtz through interviewing my podcast, and we became really good friends through it. So I believe if you have a business, you should have a podcast, period. The same thing, David believes if you have a business, you should have a book club, period, period. for your staff. Um, <laughs> podcasting is much more personal for me, though, because it's not just about your business. It's about leaving a legacy for yourself and for your guests. And it was inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were concentration camps in Nazi Germany. They were only people to survive of their family. But his legacy lives on because an interview was done by the Holocaust Foundation with him. And I can continue to watch it every year. It's on my about page. And it really inspires me. And so yes, podcasting will help your business, but it helps you and your guests leave a legacy of knowledge behind. Um, so if you have questions about podcasts, you want to start a podcast, which I sh think you should if you're a business, but if you just have questions, you can email support at rise25media.com. We do it all. So you show up and talk. We take that and put it everywhere on the web pretty much. So, and I want to introduce my guest today. This has been long, a long time awaited. We have David Long, founder and CEO of My Employees. It's a 30 plus year a uh, firm in the top 1% worldwide in the employee engagement recognition industry. His firm specializes in helping managers build stronger relationships with their team. Some of their current and past clients, you definitely have heard of FedEx, Walmart, McDonald's, Lowe's. I could, the list goes on and on. Um, and David believes what Zig Ziglar said was required to become truly successful. And Dave and I both were talking. We both listened to his audio cassette tapes in the car over and over. And he said, yeah. you can have anything you want in life if you will first help others get what they want. And you should check out his best-selling book. His, he's a best-selling author of Built to Lead, um, Seven Management Rewards Principles for Becoming a Top 10% Manager. And that's he'll, he'll talk about the acronym rewards and what that stands for. And, and plus, he takes, some years he takes off 26 weeks a year off. And 24. because, he, 20, 24, whatever. 24. <laughs> I don't care if it's 20, it's impressive. If it's 10, it's okay. impressive. Um, because he has a rock star team in place. Um, right. So David, thank you for joining me. Happy to have the opportunity, buddy. There's so many places I want to start. Um, but I want to start with the biggest question and your biggest belief, which is the number one thing business owners can do and um, it relates to your COO, but what's the number one thing business owners can do? Constantly develop your people. Never, never stop. There's always something new they can win. There's, there's so many different facets of business. Like for example, in manufacturing, why would you not learn lean manufacturing as opposed to just manufacturing? Why would you not learn the Toyota right. production system, right? So you get, I paid for four of us to go to, to Japan actually wow. to Lexus and Toyota uh, to be able to learn from the masters. And it was so funny. You, you get a kick out of this story real fast is we had this little uh, production area 
and it was one of the one of the firms that actually provides Lexus. And they took us in there and they said, okay, here's the parts and here's what needs to be done. All you guys from America, you go ahead, or like 40 of us. So you go ahead and set it up and be the most efficient you could be. And a lot of these guys were very, very good at, at lean manufacturing. So we set it up. We're so proud of ourselves, man. And they go through there and they go and they, we timed everything start to finish, you know. And uh, we did it. And I think it was like 17 minutes, right? What were you so making? They, what were you making? It was actually a part to go into a, uh, a, a uh, what was it? It was, the, it was the cooling fan, the housing and the fan, basically. So we did that. I think it was like 17 minutes we did it in. And then they said, okay, okay, that's your best. That's the best you got. Yeah, we can't do it any better. So we moved all that out of the way. And then their employees came in, put everything together, and did it in a third the time. Wow. And we were like, good grief. <laughs> we don't know Disney Squad. So, I mean, it was really awesome to be able to learn from the masters. With what were some of the lessons you learned there from them? Well, I, I can tell you what I learned from it. And I talked about it in my book, you know, W. Uh, Edward Deming. You know, Deming was asked by uh, uh, McCarthy, MacArthur, pardon me, Douglas MacArthur to come over to Japan when he was basically running the place after World War II. He asked him to come over and help the Japanese with their manufacturing. And so he went over there and helped them. But before that, the American manufacturers, Deming wanted to help the American manufacturers, but they were so arrogant that they didn't take his help. So mm. he went over to Japan, and as a result, Japan kicked our butts because they learned quality control and how to manufacture the right way. And they, like I said, Toyota, Lexus, prime example of that. So the number one thing business owners can do, and it relates to your COO of yeah. 22 years. Yes. Uh, Adam, he's he, we still great relationship. There's nothing negative or anything, but he was going to be 22 years as my COO. Production manager, and then later COO. And, you know, I, I continue to spend a lot of money on him, invested a lot into him. I actually paid for his MBA from the Walton Business School in Arkansas, which is an up and coming school. They've got phenomenal professors and everything there. So I did all that and invested in him the, his whole career with me. And then one day he asked me, he said, you know, I, I want to be CEO. And I'm going, I'm not ready to be to give that up yet. You know, I'm not ready to hit the, you know, the, I'm, I'm not a big golfer anymore, but I'm, I, I love what I do. I'm not ready to quit yet. So he had the opportunity to go work for one of our suppliers, uh, a virtual CFO firm, as their CEO. So he took a, a huge cut in pay, but he went over there because that's ultimately what he wanted to do. And I totally support him on that. And actually, he's our contact with that company. So he still is interacting with us on a monthly basis. So when he left, my first, I'm not going to kid you, Jeremy. He, he actually said, I want to talk to you. So we went and met at a coffee That's shop. That's never also. a good, never good first way to yeah, start. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I, he's never not looked me in the face, in the eye, right? So I'm like, uh-oh, this can't be good. What's going on, Adam? He said, he said well, yeah, he says, I'm, I'm leaving. I said, uh, I figured as much, something like that, if you weren't going to look at me. So anyway, so we proceeded to talk, and he said, this is an opportunity. I want to be CEO. And it wasn't anything hostile against me. He just wanted to do yeah. something I wasn't ready to give up. So. I support him and, and I literally do. He's like a son to me. Anyway, so for two days, he said, I, I want you to keep this quiet. Uh, if you don't mind until this was on a Friday afternoon until Monday, I want to talk to the top people that have been with us a long time. I will tell them individually. And I said, okay. I said, but after that, we need to tell all the employees. And we were talking about telling them not meet. He was going to meet with them on Monday morning, but we weren't going to have book club until Wednesday morning at nine 30. Like we do every week. So I said, I don't want to wait two days. I said, we're, you know, 60 employees. Somebody's going to slip up and say something. Totally. I don't want that. You know, it's right. So I said, I, either we're going to have a meeting at one o'clock or if you want to, you can write an email. He had a meeting or something. I said, okay, you can write an email. I need that done by four o'clock that day. I want you to attach your letter of resignation to it as well. So that all the employees would see that it was not anything hostile between Adam and I. He, he did two pages typed. Okay. A page and a half of that was all the things he's learned from me. Mm. So as I said, it was a very positive thing. So I wanted him to share that. So immediately, the employees obviously started to, to panic. So I answered the email back to everybody. And I said, okay, understand this. Adam is a CEO, coordinates. Adam doesn't do sales. Adam doesn't do collections. Adam doesn't do some coaching. He doesn't do production. He doesn't do any of that. You guys do that. All he does is coordinate it. The company's not going to miss a beat. And then for two days after he told me Friday, 
So it was like Friday night and Saturday and into Sunday. And I just really, then, it, then, it, then that peace came over me. I'm going like, you're ready. I've developed people. Adam's helped me develop other people. Mm. We're ready. I've got, I've got two great candidates on staff to be COO. So to make a long story short, we picked one of them. We put them in place. The sales manager, who was very tight with Adam, she decided she wanted to do something else. She'd been with me, I think, 11 years. Adam was with me 22. And we had our top salesperson who slid right into that spot. And no, no hostility. Everything was fine. But I mean to tell you, again, we just had, I was telling you this before we started recording, we had our biggest month in history of the company last month, 1.939 million. That's respectable. Congratulations. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're not, it's more not than respectable. The ball at all. We yeah. are, we are on a, yeah. on a trajectory to have the best year we've had in four years. Why were they up in arms? They just, any change? Just nervous, nervous. None of, none of the employees outside of myself and my family members, a few of them had ever worked at the company without Adam being there. Mm. So they didn't know what to expect. So I calmed their nerves down and, and we're doing phenomenal. Mm. We hadn't missed a beat. David, what did he say he learned from you? Oh, good the- grief. Uh, const- the things we just talked about, constantly be learning, constantly challenging yourself, challenging existing thesis and uh, ideas and I, you know, techniques, challenge everything all the time. One of the first things that I, I tell new employees when they come to the company, I tell them, I say, look, I want you to look and see exactly what it is that we do here in your new position. And I want you to look at that with fresh eyes. And I want you to say, I want you to challenge us. Why do you do this this way? Why do you do that that way? Because you're coming in with your life experience and your work experience, and you can, you can bring that with you. And we want you to, be, we want to benefit from that. So if you see what we're doing and you want to question that, we would appreciate it if you question it and let us know and let, make us defend everything that we do and the way we do it. You know, you surprised how many things we learn by doing that. You know, we'll get into, um, obviously right now, your company is just humming along and it, yep. life wasn't always like that. And we'll get into that. You started yeah. this from scratch mm-hmm. in your parents' house. Um, the garage, yeah. In garage. And, but I'm, I'm just curious, how have you evolved as a leader? So like take at 22 years ago, mm-hmm. David Long. Yeah. When you, you're starting with, with Adam and then now, how have you evolved? What things have changed from then until now? I am much better at scaling hmm. different aspects of the business. I am much better at analyzing things. Um, you know, being a ben- the benefit of being in a mastermind with, with high-level executives or owners of other you know, entrepreneurs of companies uh, and their companies is the fact that you can learn from what it is that they're doing that works for them, the failures they've had, the mistakes they've made, and the lessons they've learned. Why would you want to reinvent the cockeyed wheel when you can learn from somebody else's mistakes? That's the number one thing. And one of the things it says in, in the Bible, it says iron sharpens iron. Mm. That's why I'm in mastermind groups. That's, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've learned is you don't know diddly squat mm-hmm. in the scheme of things. Right. Keep always I say, I call it ABL, always be learning. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the most successful people I know are humble and they yeah. realize they know, they don't know what they don't know and they will That's continue right. to learn. Yeah. And you're one of those people. There, there's um, one of them. Let me, let me say this yeah. old Chinese proverb. They said, when you're green, you're growing, but when you're ripe, you rot. Hmm. So always be green. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Uh, so on that note, David favorite, I know this is going to be a long conversation, but whatever, wherever you want to take it, okay. you know, I know you're a huge proponent of book clubs. So I'll be talking about that in a second, but yeah. you're some of your favorite books of all time that are okay. musts for managers, for, you know, CEOs or people sure. in business. The number one book. Um, and we start book club with this when, when I have a lot of, uh, leaders and managers that I've taught down through the years uh, that they start their own book club. The number one book I tell them to start with is Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a classic written in 1937, I think. But uh, and it's like, I don't know how many revisions, but good grief, it's just a bunch. But it's all about relationships. And that doesn't matter if it's your wife or your kids or your friends, or your coworkers, 
you know, uh, you got to be able to have a relationship with people. You got to be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And it's a phenomenal book for that. So that's what we start off with. And uh, I will tell you this, we read it in, in uh, we've read it several times down through the years in book club. But I remember when we had 36 employees. Um, at the end of reading that book, I had four of my employees come up to me or send me a text or email or whatever and say, Dave, that book saved my marriage. And I'm going, well, tell me. So they would tell me why and, you know, the things that they were having challenges with before reading the book. And I remember of the four people, Jeremy, today, uh, one of them actually ended up getting divorced and it was my employee's fault. It wasn't her husband's fault, by the way. But the other three are going strong. Hmm. And one of those people is my sales manager today. And he was, he realized, he, he told me I was realized I was being a, a schmuck to my wife and that book helped me realize that I was being, I was wrong. I didn't look at her feelings. I only looked at my own. Hmm. So now he's immensely successful. Matter of fact, he's the best salesperson I've had in the history of the 30 year history of the company, hmm. but he keeps learning. He's got the same mindset that you and I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it helps if the, the home front is strong for Absolutely. the work front too. Yeah. So how do win friends influence people? What else, what else is on your top list? Uh, one of the books we read in the last year or so, which was quite good, uh, is Crucial Conversations. Hmm. You know, we had one of our employees tearfully share her relationship with her mother-in-law. You know, I'm not going to say her name because I don't want to embarrass her if she ever sees this. But, but she just said her mother-in-law was always beating her down. And she just finally, she, she was always crying. You know, when her mother-in-law would leave, it just destroyed her. So finally, after reading that book, she had the courage to go pull her mother-in-law aside and basically say, you're being a schmuck. You know, I'm doing the best I can. I'm working hard, yeah. you know, and everything. So, I mean, it, it did a phenomenal job of fixing that relationship. Now, they've been married for 10 years. Hmm. Why would you not want to have that conversation as quickly as possible? Right. <laughs> Another great book is, uh, that we read was Dave Ramsey's. We actually, we read one of his books. We also, I bought Financial Peace University for my company. I was the very, it was actually designed for churches. But I was the very first company, according to the executives at the company, they ever let buy it. And I had to go up three levels to get them to sell me that. <laughs> I said, hey, I'm trying to teach my employees how to manage their money. I want this. I said, I paid for it to have it at our church, but I said, I want it for my employees. So they allowed me to buy it. But they told me I was the very first one they ever let buy it. For the mm. companies. So to give you a little history why that matters. And, and by the way, book club, you know, we have it once an hour a week, every, every week. Uh, 9.30 on Wednesday to 10.30 or, you know, quarter to 11 or 11. Sometimes we go over. I, I don't want to stop the flow of phenomenal conversations, so I will let it run long. Um, but I forgot what I was going to say. So the book club. Saying. You were going to talk about probably the structure of the book club, why book club. How, yeah. how do you structure the book club? Uh, it's, it's, well, what we do is I, I buy books and I pass them out. And they'll read a chapter if it's, if it's a short uh, chapter or they'll read a couple, but then they come back in there, you know, a week later or whenever, and, and they'll talk, we'll talk about that chapter or chapters. But what I was going to say on Dave Ramsey is before we started book club, I used to have people come borrow money from me all the time. We had 11 employees back then, but I'll bet you three or four of them would come borrow money from me. And I paid them well, very well, actually. And uh, I got kind of frustrating, but one of the side benefits of learning uh, Dave Ramsey's principles and money, total money makeover is the book that we used way back when and financial peace university is my employees don't come ask me for money anymore. Rarely ever. Hmm. I can count on one hand how many people have come to me in the last uh, five years and asked me for money, borrow money, you know, and one of those didn't really ask to borrow money. We had a hurricane here last year and two of our employees, their homes were flooded. Hmm. So I gave money, but I also, you know, he came back later uh, and said, would it be okay if I borrow a little bit? You know, and I let him pay back later. It doesn't matter. I don't charge him any interest or anything. But overall, I'm saying that fixed the problem. Because let me explain this, why that's important. Down through the history of my company, the people who borrowed the most money from me ultimately stole from me. Hmm. So if I can help my people manage their money better, I help them have a better relationship as well because 85% of marriages the core problem is they're arguing over money. You spent too much or how to spend it. One of those two. So it's, it's, it's massively beneficial and impactful on any company. So you structured one chapter a week 
Yeah. And if, if you, it's long. Yeah, yeah, you have an hour. And then yeah. after, you know, whatever, 10, 15 weeks, you should, you finish a book and you go to a new book. That's correct. And then how do you, how do you facilitate the book club itself? You, well, I know you have yeah. someone leading it. Yeah. If I'm there when I'm in town, I like to lead it myself, but I don't lead it. Even when I'm there, I don't lead it all the time because I want to, I'm developing my leaders. That's another thing, which is an immensely beneficial aspect of book club is we ask for volunteers and I'll give you a prime example. I was in California on vacation a few years back and I remember Adam calling me up and he said, we had a conversation. Oh, he goes, by the way, you're not, you're never going to guess who volunteered to lead book club. And I said, who? And he said, Josh Straw. I said, Josh Straw. He's the most introverted person in the whole company, painfully shy. I said, holy cow, you're kidding me. I said, don't you dare let him do it till I get back because I want to hear this. So he did. And I remember Jeremy, uh, Josh is up in front of the room and it's like this book, like my phone is, is his book and his hands are shaking. Right. And, and he was just, out of was his comfort so, zone. yeah, totally. But you know what? He nailed it. He did a phenomenal job. And I got up and I put my arm around him in front of the other 50 some employees at the time. And I said, guys, what you see right here in Josh is pure courage. I said, you know, as well as I do, he's the most shy person in history in, in this whole company. <laughs> I said in the history of company for that matter. But I said, but he got up here, he faced his fears. He got up and he, he slapped fear across the face. And I said, I am so impressed with you, son. Mm. And I said, I just want you to know, I admire you for doing this above all else, above all the other people in the company, because it was so hard for you to do it, but you did it. And I'm so proud of you. And everybody clapped. I mean, there were tears, man. I mean, we clapped and everything. You would not have believed the change in that young man after that mm. day. I'm telling you. See, that's the beautiful thing about book club is you're, you're finding your leaders and you're developing your leaders. It gives them a platform to show how they can handle the group, et cetera, et cetera. So do you have 50 to 60 people in a room or how does, how does that people, yes. 60 people in a room? So yeah. how do you get people engaged? How is the format with the leader? Oh, you'd be surprised when you ask a question, you have people, your hands go everywhere. And here's the thing is that you'll have some people that really won't say anything. So if, if I'm there leading book club and I said, okay, I haven't seen Tom say anything in a while, I'll call on Tom. I got to make sure my people are paying attention. I'm paying them to be in the room, right? But I want to make sure they benefit from it. They start daydreaming about stuff. That's not doing anybody any good. So I rein them back in. They know I'm going to call on them once in a while. So they're paying attention. David, what's uh, some of the other fan favorites books? You mentioned Dale Carnegie, Crucial Conversations, Dave Ramsey. What are some other of the, the favorites from the, the staff? I would say, well, um, let me say this. We don't just do books. Hmm. We do uh, videos. We will do like a Jim Rohn stuff once in a while. Hmm. Tony Robbins, maybe. We'll do some of these experts. We'll just put a video up on there and we'll cut it off at a half hour. Let's say the thing's an hour long. We'll cut it off at a half hour. We'll talk about it the last half hour. Hmm. Next week, we'll play the second half and talk about that. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't want to do the same thing. And by the way, summertime, when everybody's taking vacations and people are in and out, we don't read a book then normally. We don't want anybody to miss the book. So we'll do videos or something then. Uh, good grief. Uh, Dennis Waitley, you know, Zig Ziglar on goals. We used to do that every year. Mm. We've, we, we mix it up now. But we used to do Zig Ziglar the first week of every year on goals. Mm. You know, so he, and I always love Zig. He's awesome. Totally. Um, I want to go back to, you know, the time, you know, when you basically got fired. Yeah, actually. But even before that, David, did you, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you want to be something in business? What were you thinking when you were growing up? My father, who passed away about six years ago, mm, he's, he was a that. Baptist. Thank you. He was a Baptist pastor for 55 years. And uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be like my dad. I'm the oldest of six kids, five mm. sons, mm. one daughter. Wow. And uh, I, I was going to follow my dad in the ministry. And then I was in my third year. Actually, it started in my second year. But the third year, I was going like, I'm not meant to be in the ministry. This is not me. And I had the opportunity to work in a church in just about every position um, for a pastor friend of my father's for about 10 months. 
And I was going, oh yeah, this is definitely not what I want to do. <laughs> so, Why? So what, what, it just what wasn't was it? a good fit. I, hmm. I'm, I'm a type A, as you can imagine. And, uh, you know, I don't like petty stuff. And people, a lot of times in churches, a pastor, they, they have a term, it's called a pastor's heart, where they, they can handle all these people, you know, with their, with, their, with their problems and everything all the time. I don't know that I would really want to handle that. Yeah. I love developing people. But I don't want to hear people whine and all the time about things. I don't want to hear that. Uh, and people, it's, it's like people are never happy. Uh, I don't care what you do. You know, in our church, for example, my wife and I paid uh, thousands and thousands of dollars to have projectors with the screens put up. And some of the old timers are, oh, hey, we don't, you know, they don't like that. So it's like, you know, well, you, you can't win, man. <laughs> so stuff like that. I just, it just wasn't a good fit for me. I did not. I just didn't see myself doing it after that second and that third year of college. So mm. I switched to business. What was it like growing up in a house with that many kids? Oh, great. You know, we were very tight. We still are today. Uh, there's, like I said, there's six of us. Five of us live here in Wilmington, North Carolina. I have one brother who is a pastor in Wisconsin. No, not Wisconsin. That's my best friend up there. One of my best friends. Uh, he's in, he's in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. My brother is. Hmm. And, uh, he is a pastor up there, like I said, but the rest of us are all entrepreneurs. Really? Yeah. Coming from a pastor's household, that's unusual, but we're all entrepreneurs and I mean successful, all of us. What were some lessons you learned from your dad? Stick to it. Don't give up. Uh, see it through, you know, have you done everything you can do? Don't quit. You know, you just keep going. And, and I saw people take advantage of my father. Um, uh, you know, and dad, dad had a big heart again, the pastor's heart, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes he would actually give the, the money that we needed. He would give it to someone who he felt mm. needed it more. We never starved. We never went hungry. Uh, sometimes it was some nasty stuff that we ate, you know, but it was, we always had food. It was kind of funny. You'll get a kick out of this. I've been to people's houses where I was sitting at the table with their family and they passed the food around. Right. And you take out what you want on your plate? Uh-uh. No. No. Not happening in my house. You passed your plate to mom and she decided what you got. <laughs> so if you're still hungry, mom said there's bread and butter. Go get some we of that. With five boys. It was, it was six, right? Five oh, boys yeah, and one absolutely. girl. Five boys. It, it, it comes around right. to you last. It was you're an left with nothing at that point. You didn't, yeah, you didn't get past the third person if you passed the food, man. <laughs> it was funny. It seemed like from what I researched, David, you know, your dad obviously is a wonderful man, but had a really strong sense of morality. And it yeah. uh, was, there was something that happened in town, uh, specifically that was kind of a crazy story that he decided he was going to spearhead. Oh, you're talking you know about, the, talking about? the porno theater? Exactly. Oh, you read that, huh? Yeah, exactly. That was in Carolina Beach, North Carolina on the boardwalk. And it was a it had run it was a rundown type place. It's pretty vibrant today, but back then it had become like a cesspool. They had a lot of bars and you know type things, and they had the uh, you know like a topless bar kind of thing, and they had the porno theater. So my dad, the actual the city, uh, the city leaders asked my dad to spearhead that. So he did, and uh, they finally got it shut down. And then one day uh, the police called my dad and said. Uh, Pastor Long, well, we got something you need to learn about here, so need to know. So he said, come down to the police station. Well, come to find out they arrested the owner of the porno theater, who was mob-connected, by the way. He was on the way to my house. Well, I'd already left to go to college, but he was on the way to my house to blow up my house while my mom and dad were in at church. He was going to set a bomb in the house hmm. and set it off for when they got home and blow up and kill all my family. And they found the, the guy, they stopped him for some unknown reason. Wow. I guess divine providence, if you will. It sounds like you know? it. It's just, yeah. it was so just they, a they, random stop. Yeah, they pulled him over, random stop. I don't really even know what it was. They pulled him over and they had, he had the dynamite in the back. He had all the stuff that he was gonna put in the house. And uh, they were, what is this? So during the course of, you know, uh, browbeating him, if you will, interrogating him, he confessed that's what he was going to do. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So take me back to the time you 
had to move in. You had to move back into yeah. your, what, what led up to that point? I was you, flying high in the retail world. Quite frankly, I was doing very well. I was one of the top seven managers out of 1200 uh, on the East coast of the United States. And, um, I did, I, you know, I'm a, I'm an, a, I'm ADD like most entrepreneurs that I know is you, a bunch of people. Um, and I, I didn't like necessarily doing everything the way they wanted to do it. And I didn't think the way they paid our people was fair. You know, splitting commissions was an issue. And anyway, I broke that rule. And I remember I, the reason I know I'm one of seven is because I was chosen one of seven people to do the district manager interviews. And I had been audited three times already because I had done phenomenally well. So they were going, what's this guy doing? He's kicking them, everybody's butt. 42 managers in my district. And I won every contest they had. Every one of them. And uh, so they, they audited me a lot. So they came to audit me for the interviews for the district manager. And they asked me a question they never asked me before. And I remember his name was Paul Zeller, a super nice guy. And he goes, Dave, he said, are there, any, are there any policies of the corporation that you disagree with? And I said, uh, yeah. And he goes, he looks up from his paper, goes, which one? And I said, I don't agree with the split and commission thing. And he goes, well, let me ask you a question. Have you, have you broken that policy? And I was like, ooh, I'm busted. So, you know, you had that momentary little thing where you're going to tell a lie. And I was just like, no, you know, I got to live with that. So I told the truth. I told him and he said, oh, Dave, he says, this is the hardest phone call I've ever had to make in 20. He had been with the company 20, 21, or I think years at the time. I said, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, this is pretty serious. I'm going, why? You know, you're not losing any money. You know, you know, I'm not paying too much. I'm, I'm just making sure the right people get the yeah, right money. Talk about what that meant, the split commission. Well, I think it's example, important because it, you, it yeah. If you came in my store and I worked with you, this was back when computers first came out and you could, a computer system that today you could buy on this phone today is a hundred times more powerful than the computer systems back then, but you would pay 10, $20,000 for. So if a salesperson worked with you and I wanted to make sure the right person got the commission and if, if you, if you, you and I split several hours together and you said, Oh, I forgot my checkbook. And then you came back that night and I was gone you, and you were going to come in the next day, but you decided you'd come back that night anyway. And you wrote out the, the check and everything. And you gave the invoice, the person working part-time got that sale. And their idea was that it's going to be a wash. No, it might be on a little radio, but it's not going to be on a computer system. No way. Right. So I broke that policy. <laughs> Yeah. So I you wanted to make Paul, sure everyone got paid fairly for the time they spent yeah. on the no, project. No money was wasted. Right. I just wanted to make sure that everybody got they, what they were due. And uh, I remember he called up the divisional vice president of the company and he put me on the phone. Oh, I remember him saying, he said, uh, yeah, I'm here uh, with David Long and he's broken a policy and yeah, he's, he's done, you know, something with the splitting the, the compensation, whatever. I forgot how he said it, but he said, uh, and he goes, oh, no, no. so he puts me on the phone with him. And I'll never forget the guy's name. His name was Tom. And he was an older gentleman. He got on the phone and he cursed at me. He goes, blankety blank, David, you're one of my superstars. What the blankety blank were you thinking? And I'm going, I really don't agree. Nobody gives a blankety blank. Why do you care about that? And he goes, son, you blew it. And he said, hand the Paul, the head the phone back to Paul. And I was like, I was dumbfounded, right? Mm -hmm. He hands the phone back to Paul. And I remember hearing Paul specifically say, Sir, are you sure David's one of our best? And I'm like, what's that? So he says, okay, I'll take care of it. And he hangs up and he goes, give me your keys. I said, my keys? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I went from being one of the top seven out of 1,200 to give, to give me your keys, you know, in a matter of a minute. So I was like, holy crap, man, that's amazing. So anyway, I was, I was devastated. I went through seven jobs in three and a half years after that. I, one of them was AT&T. I was there a year. And back then, Jeremy, you're too young to remember that, but they used to have it. It said AT&T, the right choice. And I used to put dot, 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 except for David Law. <laughs> <laughs> I hated that place. Any, that's, entrepreneurs can't work for companies like that. It will drive you up the stinking wall. You had to go through three levels, Jeremy, to be able to go to the bathroom. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> so, and I wasted all of my retirement starting that job with AT&T because back, they're unionized. So they, 
they were not competitive in the real world back then. Now, keep in mind, this is 30 some years ago. You know, they were not going to pay me what someone who'd been at the company seven years. They looked at time in as opposed to what you bring in. People like me, I was the top salesperson in the Charlotte region. But I didn't make enough money to pay my house payment, much less than anything else. I lived off my retirement for a year while I was waiting for the union to approve the pay plan. And they didn't approve it. They kept it the way it was. And I ended hmm. up had, I just had, but I, I wasted all my life savings, all of it, all my retirement. So I had no choice but to get a job somewhere else. So that was one of the seven. So at what point do you then move back in with your parents? Oh, dear Lord. And then and talk about, it's not, you were not single at the time. So tell people. No. Wife and three children. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My kids were seven, five, and three. And uh, yeah, I, uh, my father contacted me. We sold, let me tell you this. We sold our house two weeks literally before we lost it in foreclosure. Thank the good Lord for that because we, you know, it had been worse. So we moved into an apartment and then it was just a struggle after struggle after struggle. And, fin- and I wasn't like I wasn't working hard. I even told my wife after all this was over, Jeremy. I remember saying to her, honey, I, I really wouldn't have blamed you if you left me during that time. And she said, David, she said, if I knew you weren't doing everything you could do, I probably would have. Hmm. But I, I wasn't sitting around wasting my time. I can never I see you hard. sitting around nah, wasting not time. Gonna happen. Yeah. Not yeah. Gonna happen. So ultimately, you know, we moved into the apartment and I remember my father contacted me in uh, April of two, pardon me, of 1988. And he said, son, your mother and I were talking. And uh, we would like to offer you the chance to move back home with us and start over again. Hmm. And I'll never forget how I said this, Jeremy. I said, yeah, right, dad. You know, I'm not moving home. And, uh, and I remember it got worse. It got worse. And my father, we figured this out later. My father called me a year later in April of 1989. And he said, son, I'll never forget these words, Jeremy. Son are you any better off this year than you were last year? And I said, no, dad, I'm worse. And he said, well, the offer still stands. I said, all right, dad, I'm coming home. Mm. I don't even have this month's rent. So we had a yard sale. We had no money. We had a yard sale and we sold everything that we didn't have to have to be able to get a U-Haul truck. And the things we couldn't get in the U-Haul truck, we left on the curb for the neighbors to pick up. Hmm. And we moved home with mom and dad in their 1,340 square foot house. Uh, and I started my company in their garage in a five foot by five foot spot in July with no AC. <laughs> so I was in there two months and I got get, a little nine by if 12 If you couldn't office. get any more humbled. Yeah, yeah. At that point. Yeah. That's it. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. What do you, I mean, that, again, if you're single, that's tough. It is. Alone. Yeah. But you have a wife and three kids. I did. That's devastating. Um, what do you tell your kids at the time? You know, uh, I can't, that, I can't, this is, I mean, this is, should be made, forget about the book, David, just create a movie out of this, right? I mean, this is. <laughs> I could actually, <laughs> but it's I kind mean, of funny. Yeah, I mean, just thinking like, what would I tell my kids if I went home? What, what, what did you tell them? Yeah. I just said that, you know, things aren't working out. Yeah. You know, and I said, I've been trying and I said, for whatever reason, and I I said, whatever reason the good Lord has not letting me be successful. Let me tell you this before I moved home with mom and dad, I actually tried to make some sales. I worked at one of the jobs I had those seven jobs was circuit city back when they were in their heyday. I remember they were the biggest electronics retailer in the country. And I was working for them one Christmas and I was a good salesperson, so they, the manager of the store knew me when I was in, in another company, and he liked me. So he asked me, he said, Dave, I know you can sell. Come work for me. So I was in the video department, which is where everybody wanted to work because that's where you made the big money. He put me right in there. A lot of other people were mad that he put me there, but I, I de- delivered, so that was all well and good. While I'm there at the end of the year, and see, I engraved jewelry when I was in high school. That's how I paid my way through school hmm. and college. So I knew how to engrave, so I, talk, I saw up on the wall they had plaques, and I asked Don, who was the operations manager, I said, Don, what do you pay for those? He told me. I said, seriously? He said, yeah. I said, I tell you what, I've got some engraving equipment. Can I make some samples let you see what I can do for you? He goes, Psh, all right, whatever. Kind of like that, you know. So I brought in the samples. He goes, whoa, these are a lot nicer than what we got. What kind of price do we charge? I said, I'm going to save you about 30%. So 
I sold him. I went the same day and I sold the other two Circuit City stores, Freedom Drive and South Boulevard in Charlotte. And, uh, but that wasn't enough to stop the bleeding. That was the beginning of 1989 hmm. in January. So three months later, in essence, I had to move I'm back home with mom and dad. But the light bulb was on and the seed the was planted. Was yeah. So you move in, you're working in your parents' garage. Yep. Talk about some of those initial sales. You're the, you're, that's it. It's you and you're going and you're cold calling, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, um, I was interviewing with, I didn't want to go back into retail, Jeremy. Oh, dear Lord, I hated the idea of it, you know, 60 hour weeks and stuff. So I had, uh, I tried to sell back up in Charlotte and, and it was, every door was shut in my face except Circuit City. Nobody was interested in what I was trying to do. So I had to move back home with mom and dad. And then I was in town. I had those samples. Remember the samples I made for the, the manager, Circuit City? Yeah. For whatever reason, those were in the back of my car. I did not know they were back there. I was in Wilmington, which was like half hour from Carolina Beach. And I was up in town. I'd been interviewing with a jewelry company. I, I had done five interviews with them over two and a half months from April into July, basically. And they were promising me this and promising me that. And then they said, we've had so many people apply. We're going to drop the starting pay from 24000 to seventeen. And You've got to move to Colonial Heights, Virginia or Birmingham, Alabama, one of our stores. And I said, uh, no, I can't do that. I just moved here. I can't afford to go anywhere and move for that amount of money. Because I was used to making more than double that. You follow me? Back, even back then, a lot more. I, you know, I made very well and, uh, you know, there for a while, but for many years. But that was a wake-up call. And I was like, man, I am really at the bottom here. So I was running an errand in town, and I had on boat shoes, shorts, and a polo shirt. And I remember I was in, and I happened to see those plaques in the back of my Honda Accord. So I'm driving home and I, you know, whether anyone believes in divine providence or whatever I do, it's all that really matters to me, but I'm driving home and I, I see this real estate office over in the distance over on the left. And I was like, something said to me, go in there. Hmm. So not verbally, I'm not a nut job, but I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I just felt compelled go in there. So I did, I pulled in, I got those circuit city plaques out of the back and I walked into the, the real estate agency. And I walked in, I'll never forget the secretary's name was Ruby. She's a really sweetheart. And I walk in, I said, I'd like to talk to the person who's in charge of agent recognition. And she said, well, that'd be Chuck Spooner. He's in a meeting. Can you sit down and wait? And I said, oh, sure. So I sat down and I, while I'm sitting there, I'm realizing I don't even know what I'm going to charge. <laughs> I mean, you talk about half cocked, you know, uh, I had no clue. So Did I you said, know what you were going to say even? No, not really. Oh, okay. yeah. I would just say I do these for Circuit City and I can do it for you basically, you know. Yeah. I hadn't thought this out. This was a whim. So I said, can I borrow your calculator? She said, okay. So she hands me a calculator and I'm figuring it out. I'm, this is, keep in mind, this is 30 years ago and, I, and, and our products are so much nicer and everything now. But I remember I looked at it and I came up with a price point close to what I was doing for Circuit City. So I said $199.95, the big plaque and 12 little, you know, they were particle board. They weren't really all that nice back then. And, uh, I got, and I divided that by 12, that was 1665. So finally I get to get in to see Chuck and I'm showing him the plaques. Oh, these are nice. I like these and everything, you know? And I said, and then I said, for your agent recognition, it would be 199.95. And he goes, well, I got a problem. And I'm going in my mind, that's all I need more rejection, right? <laughs> that's first thing, you know, cause you're beat down like a dog. So when someone says I got a problem, all of a sudden that's my problem, right? Got a deal. So he said, we recognize two agents a month. So I came back into reality and I said, uh, oh, that's not a problem. <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> we can double the price. Don't worry yeah, about yeah. it. <laughs> so, so he says, what kind of price will you give me for two programs? And I'm going 16, 65. I'll do, I'll do two for 30. He said, 25 sounds awfully nice. <laughs> and I said, 2750 sold. And he laughed. He said, okay, we'll split the difference. <laughs> so I said, Chuck, I said, uh, I've got to buy the product and do the work and bring it to you. Would it be possible for me to get half the money up front and half upon delivery? And he said, don't worry about it. He says, you've got an honest face. He said, what's the total? So I said, can I borrow your calculator? <laughs> so I didn't know what was going to tax and everything was going to be. So I had no clue. So I said, I got his calculator. I figured it out. Mm -hmm. It was $346.50. So he just wrote me the check out for three forty six fifty. dollars mm -hmm. So I walked out and as I'm going, I went out to, to my Honda Accord, opened up the trunk and I, I put the plaques in the car and all of a sudden it hit me. 
And I said, thank you, Lord, and what a country. You know, that I could do that in America, but, you know, thank the Lord that he told me, go in there. I walked out with a check for $346.50, hmm. and my, that was my first sale when I was officially in business. Hmm. So I went home, and my, I told my mom and, my, of course, my wife and my mom and my dad. And there, I remember my dad going, he gave you the check up front? I said, yeah. So the next day, I got all dignified, put on a coat and tie, you know, suit. And I literally went two blocks up to David Swire, Century 21. He's still a client today. And um, I walked out of there with another check for $346.50, and I never looked back. We're in business, baby. That's right. We're, we're cooking with the Crisco now. Wow. Yeah. 346. Yeah, 50. To one fifty, <laughs> I don't want to lose that. 50, yeah, to lose one, 50 to one point nine eight million dollars. That was last month. month yeah. Last month. It's yeah. a pretty amazing journey, I would say. It is. I've been immensely blessed to have phenomenal uh, team members all along the way. Was there even such thing as an agent recognition agent a uh, person? Like, did you make that up when you walked in, or did you know you made yeah. it? Up. Like, who's in charge no, of I mean, agent they, recognition? Some that, of, some of, I mean, most salespeople get recognized some form or another, right? Right. And I just knew that they had salespeople. Yeah. So I said, you're agents. I, I'm here to speak to you about agent recognition. So yeah, that was what I did. Wow. Thank you for telling that story. That's Glad amazing. To. What were some of the other milestones along the way? So that was a huge milestone, obviously. Let me first tell you sales. the story. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you the first really seed of doubt that I had that maybe I'm making a mistake. Hmm. Uh, but let me tell you this first, because this, this is important that I tell you this, because it was the driving force in the back of my mind that I did not want to quit. Remember I told you my dad was always don't quit. Well, my dad being a pastor was more of a security minded individual. Entrepreneurs were a foreign thing to him. So I remember my father saying, son, you do that engraving thing on the side and go get a real job. Be a smart thing to do. Right. So that's back there. So that mm. was driving. I want to prove my dad wrong, right? So I'm in Orlando. This was like six months in. I've been doing great. I get down to Orlando, and I'm paying all my own expenses. I'm staying in flea bag motels. I mean, Motel 6, buddy, was living large. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, so I'm, I'm down there, Jeremy, for four solid days, all day. I started at 8.30 or to 9 in the morning, and I went to 9 at night because retail stores are still there. So I was calling on people all day long. You go door, door to door. Yes. No appointments. Door to door. Four solid days. No sales. Mm. And I remember, I remember that, that night, and I was, I was really getting, getting down. I was starting, oh, man, maybe I'm not meant to do this. And I remember the next morning I went to the Sam's Club in Orlando, and I went in there, and I was talking to the manager. I showed him the plaques. Oh, these are great, you know. And, uh, he said, but I can't make this decision. I was like, oh, and he says, but the district manager's upstairs. And I said, oh, that's not a problem. We can go see him. <laughs> so we went up there. I'm talking to the district manager. He said, I've got 10 stores. He said, what kind of price will you give me for 10 stores? So I told him. And, uh, and then I said, we got it. We're going to do it. It's going to happen and everything. You know? So I said, all right, this is, this is a very big order. It's the biggest order I've had at one time. Because these are big, big programs, right? Sam's Club's so huge. 10, 10 yeah. Sam's Clubs. Yeah, 10. So I said, can I get some money up front, half up front and half later? So we went downstairs and he's whipping out all these hundred dollar bills. Kept going, you know, which was awesome. So because I've been beat down so much, I would, this was in Orlando. I literally, I know this sounds terrible, but I was so jubilant and so elated that I didn't sell the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. I went, uh, I actually went to Walmart, bought a pair of cheap swimming trunks, went to Daytona beach and went out on the beach and spent the rest of the day. <laughs> and I felt great about it, man. I'm telling you, I needed that. I really did. But I mean, it was, you need to decompress from a total waste, a total fail to one of the best weeks that I'd had ever. The life of a salesperson. Right? It is indeed. I mean, yeah. you gotta lose. get 10 doors closed on your face before you get one. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Sam's Club was a big milestone. Yeah, it was. So fast forward, what's, what's I never, another? I never doubted anything after that. Hmm. I mean, I'm looking at your site right now, trusted by over 9,000 managers. 
you know, there's yeah. Outback, there's Cheesecake Factory, there's Marriott, there's Walmart, Those are all there's current. McDonald's. We have, we have all the cheesecake factories in the company. We have all the Capitol Grills mm -hmm. in the country. We have all the chart houses. We have uh, tons of uh, good grief. FedEx Grounds, Cracker Barrel, mm -hmm. Targets. Uh, we've got all, we're all over the place. Uh, real estate, some auto dealerships. We don't really go after them so much, but we do them. Um, David, what's the, what's the products look like now? What do Talk well, if you go to myemployees.com, uh -huh. you have, uh, mm -hmm. we do, it's not just, it's not just plaques or acrylic little trophy deals. That's just a tool. What makes us successful, Jeremy, is that we have a coaching aspect that we assign an engagement coach with you all year long to help you be able to maximize your return on investment from employee recognition. We find out, or our, coach, our coaches do, we have 10 coaches. And they work with their clients and they ask you, what are you trying to improve in your business, Jeremy? Oh, we want to, you know, our gross margins are terrible. Okay. Instead of incentivizing top line, we're going to incentivize gross margin. You know, so we, you focus the recognition on improving the things that make you money and make you successful. That's why we're different. No other company out there does it right. the way we do it. Period. It's not like they just buy, yeah, they're not just buying no. a plaque or a trophy. It's no. the system. Yeah. They're buying a system. Exactly. It's almost a management system. Yeah, with, it is exactly what it is. Right. And what other, are there any other rewards at the end um, that you recommend, um, whether it's compensation rewards or not compensation rewards that you've seen work throughout the years? Well, I think people should have some aspect of control of their own personal bottom line. For example, in our company, I try to make it where two thirds of our employees, the vast majority of them, is fixed and a third of it is at risk. Except for our salespeople, they're 100% um, commission. Except when they're training new people. Okay. Um, so that works out really well and it keeps people engaged. In other words, if they get salary, they can goof off. Let me tell you how important and why this matters so much. Every year, we've done it now for 14 years, my wife and I pay to take the top third of our employees from each of the four departments and all of the managers and all of the support teams, all of us. So last year, we took 42 people and how people would say, well, Dave, um, how can you take all your managers, right? How can you leave the company? So to prove my point about uh, how, how important it is that you make sure you incentivize your people where at least part of their income is at risk. In other words, if they goof off, they're going to lose money. It's going to cost them money to not do the job. So when we take our champions trip every year where we take the top third of all of our employees and their spouses and then all, literally all of the managers in the company and their spouses. Right. We take them to Mexico. We've done that Mexico for several years. We've done cruises. We've gone out west, Grand Canyon, all that kind of stuff. We've done that for 14 years now. Uh, but what happens is when we're gone, the company goes on like we're not like we're there, yeah. because the employees, if they goof off, they're they're really literally hurting their own income. Mm. So we don't miss a beat, and we have done that successfully, like I said, for 14 years. So that's how important it is to make sure your people have something they can lose if they goof off. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask about that, David, but I'm going to just see the story for a second. Cause there's a great right. story where you talk about you had two top salespeople and a trophy. So I'm going to have you tell that in a second, but don't tell it yet. Are you talking about the bulldog? The bulldog. Okay. But, um, don't tell that yet. Okay. I want just to he stick on that other topic for a second because I think a lot of people, and there's a lot of conversations about this, and um, I'm really curious of your uh, expertise on compensation structure. Like you want to keep some, let's say a company wants to keep a top person in their company. They, they're amazing. They're phenomenal. Um, how do you suggest, or what have you seen work with your company and other companies as far as compensation structure for like base, they have a base salary, right? What works best as far as bonuses, profit sharing, what, what should people look at doing to keep those people in, in, you know, maybe the people right now are only salaried and they want to implement like a third where it's, whether it's bonuses or profit sharing, how do you 
uh, advise people structuring that, that other third? Well, I can tell you this. I know, I know the research on the motivation yeah. of why people stay at a company. Income is actually yeah. number five. Uh, meaningful work, feeling like they're making an impact on either society or the company or their fellow employees or their mm -hmm. clients and all that. That's the number one driver. No, right behind it is number two is recognition. I want recognition for making that impact. Mm. Uh, so, you know, again, money, once you're relatively comfortable, yes. money is no longer the big driver. And I think most successful people would tell you that mm -hmm. it's fun. You know, you can spend and go on vacation and stuff, but it's not the main driver for me anymore by any stretch. Right. I mean, I have enough and I don't have to work another day of the rest of my life. I don't want to. Right. But I love the game. Um, as far as what conversation a, for the rest of it? Yeah, like uh, let's say a manager, for sure. instance, like sales, I could see you, you know, you can work out some yeah. kind of based on sales, but let's say it's a manager and they're not, or it's an operations person that mm -hmm. they're indirectly tied to sales. How do you yeah. recommend doing that? Well, I think if it's any way, shape or form that you can do it, you should do some type of profit sharing so that people get to feed off mm -hmm. of what they create. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have that profit sharing. We do bonuses. One thing that we do, uh, and regardless of the department, we do it in sales, we do it in support. Uh, we let people who do exceptional things, we have like the wheel of fortune type deal. You know, you spin the wheel. Every, mm -hmm. every little, every little uh, number on that thing is a, a guaranteed $20 bill. But if you pick like number 17 and it lands on 17, you get a hundred dollar bill. And if it lands on 16 or 18, you get a $50 bill. So mm -hmm. we have a blast with that kind of thing. We have one of those little plink, what do you call them? Plink boards or whatever. It yes. slides down the little chip thing, a little, you know, button or whatever you call it. We do those, we play and you know, we, we have a blast, you know, when one of my people, if I'm there when they're doing it and they hit the hundred, I'll bend over, you know, <laughs> like you're robbing me here. You know, kind of deal, you know? <laughs> and uh, so they laugh. I'm, you know, it's, we have a blast, but that's, those are minor little things, but I think it's important. Uh, and again, money is to a level, uh, to a certain level, it's a big driver. Beyond that, it is not. One of the number one things you can do to keep your best people uh, is to incorporate them and their knowledge into teaching the other people. Mm. Because you're, in essence, celebrating their expertise mm. and their contribution. And that has been one of my most successful um, ideas in the history of my mm. company by far. Yeah, by far. Celebrate their contribution. Yeah. Let them, let them teach others. You know, like, for example, Nick is one of our best engagement coaches. And he is phenomenal at helping people find other ways to recognize their people and other, other means and reasons to do so. So because he's very good at that, we had Nick teach the other engagement coaches how to do it. So I'm teaching, I'm teaching and I'm uh, reinforcing my relationship with my people by celebrating them and the things that they're excellent at. Hmm. So, yeah. you know, they get, they buy in a lot more, you know, we're getting ready to go down to, because of that record month we had last month, I told you, and you know, we're going to Myrtle beach a week from today. We are shutting down the company for the whole day. We're going down there. This is the reason I'm telling you is because this is another aspect of what you can do for them is we're shutting down the company. We're going down there. We're going to go to one of our clients for lunch and then I'm going to pass out, two $100 bills to each employee. We're going to do the employee of the month while we're there because it's one of our clients and we want to let them see how we do it. And uh, we're going to videotape all that. We'll probably share it with the clients, that kind of thing. And uh, we'll let them see how important it is that things like that are done. You know, I, we, by the way, after the lunch, you know, we take a group picture where everybody holds up. I, I holler out, show me the money. Everybody holds up their money, you know, and we take a big group picture. We're laughing and we, then we do a, a crazy shot, funny, where everybody's something, doing something stupid. Uh, and then we will go out shopping. And Tanger Outlet Malls are a great places to shop down there. And then we'll meet back together again at Rio's Brazilian Steakhouse, which is a really expensive but really nice place. And we all eat there together and we're cutting up, we're laughing, we have a great time. And then we drive back home. And doing stuff like that builds the team. You know, we do two, uh, and one of the, this is one of them, what we're doing next Wednesday. We do two employee appreciation days. We do one in the summer or the spring. And we do stuff like uh, we'll have laser tag company come out, set up all those big inflatable blow up, you know, rocks and stuff. And yeah. we'll, we'll fight it out. You know, nice. uh, we have a blast and stuff like that just builds the team. Uh, like I told you already, book club is, 
probably the number one thing I've ever done mm. to build the camaraderie between employees. Before I did book club, Jeremy, mm. the salespeople would go to lunch with salespeople and the uh, support people go to with support, production with production. Mm. They stick but now you own. see people from all departments going to eat. Mm. You know, it's, it's, and then nobody wants to leave. Our turnover rate is ridiculously low, as you can imagine. Hmm. But uh, you got to practice what you preach. Yeah. The bulldog story. Oh, you want to know that one? Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to be smart about it. You don't, I, I not, and I never talk to companies about if you've only got a couple of salespeople doing salespeople of the month, uh, you know, big, big trophy or plaque or whatever for that. Um, but I did do this. I bought a little bulldog. I put it on a wood base. And I put on the front of it, big dog, D-A-W-G of the week. And our salespeople, we had two or three at the time. Actually, it was two to begin with, but then it went to three. Um, where they would, whoever had the most sales, they had that on their desk all week, the next week. So it was so funny because I remember uh, Angel and Trudy and uh, Travis, is they would go and they would yank the thing off somebody else's desk when they beat them and take it back to their desk. And they would rag on each other about, Oh, come back to your rightful owner or stuff like that. You know? really <laughs> I mean, and they would rag on each other and it was the, and it's something as simple as, you know what I paid? I paid like $15 total for that trophy. But I remember, I can't remember exactly, but it was 800 and some dollars increased sales. Now keep in mind, this is 20 some years ago. 800 and some dollars each. I think it was like 850 or 805 or something each. So if it was two people, that's 1600 extra a week huh. for a $15 little bulldog on a base. So people love competition. Uh, it's very important that you have metrics. And this is a very extremely important. If you pick your employee of the month without having metrics, people will accuse you of doing it as a popularity contest. You like David better than you like me, Jeremy. That's why you picked him. Yeah. That's, that will destroy it's your culture. Be objective. But if you have, if you have metrics where, and, and by the way, we read the metrics out loud at our employee recognition presentations in our company. Mm. We want people to know that Jeremy was number one in this and number two in this and number one in this. We tell them what we expect and what gets recognized gets repeated. So yeah. we celebrate the victories of our people. What are the metric? What are some of the metrics you look at? Yeah, like top line, uh, gross margin, how many referrals you got that month, mm -hmm. uh, how many presentations you did for prospects, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, you now like engagement coaches. You've got how many? How many welcome calls did you accomplish? Uh, and it's a percentage. If you had twenty, if you had twenty brand new clients that you had to talk to that month, and you talked to all twenty, you had hundred percent. You know, nice. if you talked to fifteen, you had a seventy-five percent. So you're ranked in that of how, how uh, you know, committed you are to getting that first critical call done with the brand new client, stuff like yeah. that. How yeah. much do they do in renewal, in renewal sales each week? You know, that kind of thing. So we have a blast. You know, we, we make it fun. We change things up so that we're not doing the exact same thing every week or every month. We change it and we let them know it's going to be changing. And here's what we're focused on this month. David, first of all, thank you. Um, I have one last question. It's, it's not a short question, but, um, but um, just I just want to take a second and thank you because um, every time I'm around you, I'm taking copious notes and my, and my <laughs> ears that, are man. wide open to your knowledge and wisdom um, that comes from in the trenches like you talked about that come from, you know, swagging out in your parents' garage yeah. to going yeah. door to door you know, selling face to face, belly to yep. belly and yep. uh, to now. So thank I you appreciate that. I appreciate for sharing that. that. And Great everyone time. should check out top 10 manager.com. Mm -hmm. Um, and which will relate to my next question because yep. everyone should check out David's book built to lead, which I talked about. Right. Um, and my employees.com. If you have a company and you want not just to recognize your top employees, but actually to put a system in place to help, the employees and the managers of that company, David's company, my employees says works with the top companies around the, the U S and, um, and all over the place. So, right. um, I wanted to, to, the last thing I wanted to talk about is rewards. Okay. Um, what it stands for from built to lead, 
just to segue <laughs> into <laughs> the book. Um, and you could just just hit the highlights. I'll yeah, I'll you can hit the summarize exactly. because people yeah. can get the book and they can check out, you know, this interview and, and other things. But I would encourage people to check out Built to Lead uh, and Top10Manager.com where they have more information about the book because yeah. David says, and, and most business people say the number one thing business owners need to do is have great people and train great people and it's your people that yep. serve the customers and yep. and help the company grow and, and thrive exactly so. exactly um so rewards the acronym it's an acronym yep within the title right subtitle uh, rewards uh, the first r is for recon as they say in the military and that goes along with jim collins good to great you know get the right people in the bus and i'll summarize it with this uh that's critical you know, you start with the managers. I don't remember if Jim actually said this or not, but uh, we start with the managers. If you've got four managers, I want you to think of them as the tires on a car. You're driving down the road, everything's okay. All of a sudden, one of the tires blows out. Or in other words, one of your managers drops the wall or decides they want to leave or whatever. So what happens when you have to change a tire? All four managers have to pull over to the side of the road and there's no further progress until you fix that problem. So first of all, before you worry about all your people, you worry about your leaders and you got to make sure they're all in, that they're committed to where you're wanting to go. If you were to take over a business or you buy a business or start a business, whatever it is, as you grow and you develop your leaders, you got to make sure you're all on the same page. So if all four tires or managers are aligned, then you've got a great, and you can tool it on down the road. You got a great team. So once you have the people, the right people in the seats on the manager position, then you sit down with each manager and you assess every team member that they have. And you say, what about, uh, what about Tom? Ah, he comes in late all the time and everything. Can you salvage Tom? Yeah, I think so. You know, let me talk to him and tell him, hey, we're not going to tolerate that anymore. All right, let's go ahead and give him another shot. Tell him we're giving him another shot and then we'll go from there. So then you check back you know, a month later, how's it going with Tom, that kind of thing. So you help your people develop their people and hold them accountable. You know, they, they, someone once said the greatest ability is dependability, but I would say that accountability mm -hmm. is right up there because you cannot, if you cannot depend on your team, you're not going anywhere as a business owner or a leader. So the second one is education, which we talked about book club. Yes. Uh, but, and we talked a little bit about masterminds, but those are the two things I talk about and the importance of both in the mm -hmm. education chapter of my mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. The next one is winners emerge. Uh, and that is basically looking at the people that you have thus far and that you are developing and learning and seeing what people can do in book club. That's where the winners emerge uh, comes that's where it is. You're, you're, you're finding your best people. They're blossoming. They're, they're standing forth above the shoulders of the other people. So those are the winners that we're talking about emerging out of the two prior points and principles. So you develop on those people and you continue to do so. The next rewards is A, which is for attitude. Doesn't matter. We, you and I both got this from Zig Ziglar, Jeremy. You know, attitude is critical. You know, if a person has a bad attitude, I don't care if they're the best salesperson in the company. Yeah. They're going to be gone. I have had to fire my top two salespeople. Actually, I should say my top salesperson twice down through the years. And both times for the same reason. Both of those individuals had come in where they weren't making all that much money. And all of a sudden, they're making 150, 200,000, which is like three, four times more than the average person in North Carolina. And then all of a sudden they start thinking theirs doesn't stink anymore mm. and they're going to, you know, that's a crude say, way to say it, but it's basically the way it is. And then they start mm. treating the other people like they're their slaves. I don't right. tolerate that. I'm going, these other people are the ones that make you look good. They're the ones who deliver on everything you sell. Right. So I've, I tell them, by the way, uh, I tell them I will warn you one time. I tell this to every, every new salesperson that comes in the company today. I say, I will warn you once. We want you to come in and be successful. I'd love it if you sell a million dollars and you make a hundred thousand your first year, which a lot of people do. I said, but if you ever treat my people like they're your slaves and you're less than you and they're less than you, you're out of here. I'll warn you one time. And I do. I just did this with the latest uh, sales training class. So that is attitude and how critical it is to the, you can't have a, you know, that song, I think it was Michael Jackson. 
you, you know, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch, right? Mm -hmm. It truly does. So you cannot allow that to stay. Right. And the next R in rewards is recognition. And the critical element that people forget is that people think they're there for a paycheck only, and that's wrong. Just do your job. I'm paying you. Just do what I pay you for. Right. That's a terrible attitude. For like you said, it's the fifth reason why people yep, actually exactly. yeah, fifth, are motivated. Money's fifth. Recognition is number two. And that's from James, uh, George Mason University. That was 1,800 uh, managers and 1,800 employees, and they surveyed them, and these are the things they came up with. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a webinar on that pretty soon. I've got all that, all that research. Will they, can they find the webinar on top 10 managers.com or where? No, they, they would, they would, uh, they would need to, um, go to myemployees.com uh -huh. and, uh, it's not there yet, but it's going to be, okay. uh, coming up pretty soon. And, uh, you can, you can put myemployees.com forward slash webinar got if it. you'd like. All right. And uh, I will make sure that's an active uh, Got it. link by the time you're ready to air this. All right. And uh, we'll put it there just so that they can go there if you want. Awesome. Anyway. Um, so on the recognition on the R, second yeah, R. Recognition. So, yeah, when you, getting back to George Mason University, they found all that and how important recognition is. But here's the thing is that according to Gallup Research, which is the largest research company in the world, they found that 65% of employees – when surveyed said they had not been man, not been recognized by their manager in the last year. Now wow. you're going to have managers going, no stinking way. I recognize them all the time, but you and I have both heard and everybody that's listening has heard this old saying is that your perception is your reality. Yes. So if you perceive, you perceive that your manager hasn't recognized you then for all practical purposes, they have not. So, that is important. So, and another thing too, and you, this is like Zig Ziglar used to say, you want to be a meaningful, specific, not a wandering generality. Mm -hmm. That applies to recognition as well, and especially, mm. especially to recognition. If I came up to you, Jeremy, and I just came and I said, Jeremy, you're doing a great job. And I walked off, you're going like, what the freak was that? <laughs> you know, what's he, is he buttered me up for, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, but if I come up to you, Jeremy, and I say, Jeremy, I just want you to know that Tom told me that you stayed an hour late the other night to help him unload the truck when one of the other guys didn't show up. I just want you to know that I personally appreciate you helping and really stepping up to help the team. Hmm. Now, that means something. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. Big difference. You see the difference between the two? Huge difference. Yeah. So that's very, very important. And recognition is in all aspects of life. Right now, we've got a new video that we're actually getting put together. And it's basically taking snippets of video of people all ages. A little Cub Scout wins the roll, the uh, what do you call it? The Derby, a little trophy, the, you know, the, the car derby. Yep. Yeah, yeah. What do you call that? I, I yeah, it. it is. It's something I, I competed derby. in that. Yeah. Soap box derby. Yeah, that's it. So anyway, uh, you know, and you've got like Michael Jordan, you know, hugging the trophy when he won his first championship, kind of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, with his dad standing, you know, things like that. You know, uh, the president putting a uh, medal around uh, the Medal of Honor winners, you know, everybody at every age and every nationality and every, you know, male, female, it doesn't matter. Everybody craves, they don't just want it. They crave recognition. Hmm. If you give it to them and they will love you and trust you and you, they will be fiercely loyal to you. And then the next, the, the uh, D in rewards is duplication. And this is why a book club, another reason is so important is that you're constantly training your people, but we take it a step further. Every one of my four leaders, the four different departments, they have to be able to tell me, who are you mentoring right now? I'm mentoring so-and-so. What are you doing to mentor so-and-so? Oh, I got them reading a book with me. Okay, great. See, they're reading a book with them, but both people are reading the book. My manager's reading the book, which is in addition to book club. And then hmm. they're talking about that and they're developing that person. Now, my managers know that they have a secure relationship with me, that they're not afraid to develop someone else because the company's growing and we're going to need future leaders for new departments and new divisions. Yeah, they so don't feel threatened. They don't feel threatened. Exactly. So they have, and I, and I pressure them on that. What have you done lately? You know, what have you done with Tom? You haven't mentioned him lately. What are you doing? Well, we're doing this now, working on a course. Okay. If you're not doing something, you need to be doing something. I'm always making sure. And I, by the way, I do not put them in that position unless they agree to do so. 
So if you're not willing to do it, then I'll get somebody else for this position. I have never had anybody not take it because of that reason. So we have constant, you know, like I said, when we, when my, my CEO of 22 years decided he wanted to be CEO of another company, it took me less than 48 hours to replace him mm. as well as our sales manager. In 48 hours, the top two positions in the company were replaced. And I just told you last month, we had a record month in the company history, 1.939 million. Mm. We had missed a beat. Why? Because we constantly develop our people. It's like, I call it in my book, Jeremy, the leadership. I call it the shark's teeth leadership development program. Why? Because I'm from the ocean. I surfed most of my life, my younger days, especially. Hmm. So I've been out there in the old ocean with a lot of sharks. So if you see a shark's mouth, you see all these rows of teeth. Well, if they're in a fight with a, another shark or prey or something and a tooth pops out, another one pops right up in its place. Hmm. That's why you develop the people beneath you and the people beneath them so that you have constantly developing the leadership of the future for your company. So you can eat your competition. Yep. So oh. that's your duplication. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You can eat your competition. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And the final one, my friend in rewards is the S and the S stands for success and success. When you look at most people and you ask them what success is, they seem to always put it in dollars in the, you know, in, in a means of, of how much money that is. But I, I want to I wanna throw ice water all over that um, because, you know, and I'm going to say it this way, is that I, and I, I didn't have this in my book, but I'm just going to tell you. I had one time, one of my friends who is a good, dear friend of mine, and I remember after I got to be pretty successful and everything, he was in a situation where his house was going into foreclosure. And I remember him calling me and say, David, I need you to buy my house and rent it to me. I need you to buy it out of foreclosure and rent it to me. I said, well, how much? That's a big ask. Yes, it is. And uh, I said, how much do you owe? I'll help you get up on payments. And he says, too late. It's already gone to foreclosure. I said, well, why are you calling me? So I want you to, you know, I talked to the guy for $16,000. He'll let you buy it for what he just paid for it. And I'm going, uh, no, I'm not doing that. So I said, you know, I'm not going to be your, your landlord. You couldn't afford to pay it before. You're not going to be able to afford to pay it now. I'm not going to lose a good friend over it. I said, you're the good friend of mine for 20 some years. I said, but your wife, she's the one from what I understand, she pays the bills. And she's going to, if she's got the two bills to pay, she's going to pay something else before she pays David Long. And I yeah. said, I'm not putting myself in that position to lose a friend and my money. So I'm not going to do that. We're still friends, but you know, it was a painful conversation, but when I say when you get a certain amount of money, the problems are bigger, mm -hmm. much bigger, you know. And uh, so let me, let me finish with, with the story of, that's in the book about the guy who at the time won the largest lottery winnings in the history of the United States. It was 300, if I recall, it was $316 million. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so when he won that money, the guy was already successful. Jeremy had 100 employees. Mm -hmm. Very successful. He's a millionaire. He was a millionaire already when he won that money. And anyway, over the space of several years, he proceeded to you know, run out on his wife and went and hang out at strip bars and all that kind of stuff. And the apple of his eye was his granddaughter. He had, he had one, one daughter and, and she had a daughter. And so his granddaughter, he had a great relationship with her. He loved her. He bought her a couple of cars and stuff like that. So after he won the millions, um, he told her, you don't need to work anymore. She was working at Taco Bell, if I recall. And uh, he told her, you don't need to work anymore. So I'm just going to give you money. So he gave her money. It was a crazy amount of money every week. It was like 1500 bucks, you know, 2000 or something like that. And I remember she ended up, because she didn't have direction in her own life, she didn't have a job anymore, and she was out of school. So she started hanging around with the wrong crowd, started doing drugs. Make a long story short, Jeremy, and you read it, I think you said. So and, and it, was on a, it was on ABC's 2020. I mean, look it up on YouTube or something and watch it. It's break your heart. But anyway, so he basically um, one day found out the police called or whatever, and his granddaughter had OD'd. Mm. She was in her car. And when they got there, you know, she, there were $100 bills or whatever wadded up in the floor. And, you know, money was there and the drugs and everything. And she OD'd. She died. And, you know, the, this, this millionaire before, you know, he won all the millions, his, his, his marriage fell apart. His daughter hated him. His, his granddaughter died. And I remember 
he had to hire people to, to, to take all the calls and solicitations for money that people wanted from him. Mm. And people sued him. Former employees sued him. His employees, current employees sued him. I mean, his life turned into a living hell. And uh, he basically, I remember when it was all said and done on the show, and I remember what they, what they said when they asked him about that. He goes, you know, the worst thing ever happened to me in my life was winning the lottery. Hmm. And it cost him everything he had. And uh, if you focus on money, you're going to be a hollow individual. You'll be the shell of a person. Hmm. It's what money can do. Money is a tool. It is not the goal. You know, you can do a lot of good things with money. You can buy drugs. You, well, you can do terrible things too. You can buy drugs with it or you can feed a homeless person. You know, you can, you can build a house for someone who doesn't have a house or you can turn it into a crack house, you know, whatever. I mean, it's money is a tool. It is not the driving force. At least it shouldn't be. And if it is the driving force, whatever you get that boat, you will not be happy when you see a bigger one. You'll have to have the bigger one and the bigger one, the plane and a bigger plane and a bigger plane, a bigger house, a bigger house, a faster car, a nicer car. It never ends. You know, one thing I've learned as I've gotten older and I'll be 62 next month is I'm very, I'm very, I'm very happy. I have a nice house. I have a nice car, but I don't have everything that I could afford to buy. You know, one of my children actually bought a boat and my, and my friends and everybody, why don't you have a boat? I said, oh, I don't want a boat. It's something else to take care of. You know, I, I, I have my wife and I have Harley Davidson's. We rode cross country, ocean, ocean, oh five. I can do things like that. Doesn't take a lot of money to do that. But if I buy a boat, I'll probably want a bigger boat and a bigger boat. So I will pay to rent someone else's. I'll pay the gas and they get to do everything else. We'll go mm. out riding. It's fine. But I don't want anything else. I got to babysit. It starts to own you, right. not you owning it. And it takes over your life. I don't want that. And, you know, I would rather, I would rather, I, my life today, I invest my money in experiences. You know, my wife and I take our, Two best friends, two couples, we take them on vacations with us. And my wife and I pay for everything. Uh, my best friends that I had when I had nothing are my best friends today. Mm -hmm. I have not changed my friends. I love the people that I have. And I talk to people like you. I get to admire people like you and know you and, and other people and like Titans and Top One and the other groups and things. But my friends or my intimate friends knew me when I had nothing. They loved Dave Long when he had nothing. And I, I try to spoil them every way I can without disincentivizing them to do their job. Mm. I'm not, not giving them enough, but I will help them do things like get a car if they need a car, stuff like that. I, you know, I, I love my friends and my family. I'm always there to help them. But I do not enable them like the rich guy that, that won the lottery who gave um, you know, all that money to his granddaughter and cost him his whole marriage as relationship with his daughter's granddaughter and all that. I, I, yeah. I'm not doing that. And uh, I even told my own children, which, you know, we, we started to, uh, I looked at selling my company because I, I just thought I would just see what I, and it was worth. We've had it value. We had four M&A firms and one of them, the lowest number was 24 million. The other one was 28 million that we would have sold it for. I could have walked away with $10 million, but then I found out um, that it would devastate the lives of my people, those, all four of those M&A firms, one of them, pardon me, two of them were going to guarantee my COO two years. And the other one, the other two were going to guarantee him one year. Nobody else in the company had a job that they were guaranteed. Mm. And I came home to my wife and I said, honey, when I found that out, I said, uh, I said, baby, we take off 24 weeks of vacation minimum every year. I said, baby, our, our life's not going to change at all. I said, but we will devastate the lives of our people. So I could have walked away with, Bottom line, by the way, my CPA said, David, you'll, you'll come out of that with a minimum of $10 million after taxes and your kids will come out after taxes a million and a half or something. And, uh, and I, I told my wife, I said, honey, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. I mm -hmm. said, we don't need the money. And I said, I, I, I spent all this time building my people and relationships and, and giving them the best life they've ever had in their cockeyed you know, existence. And as I love being able to say that, I said, I'm not going to devastate them in the next move. So we will not sell the company. And I didn't. Mm. Mm. So success ultimately is not money. It is your life and what you become and the legacy you leave. Yeah. David, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Everyone should check out Built to Lead. 
Um, you can get it on Amazon. You can go to top10manager.com and also check out myemployees.com. I want to be the first one to thank you, David Long. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. I thank you, buddy. I will say this too. Let me, let me tell you this right fast. Yeah. First of all, I appreciate the privilege of being able to speak with you today. Um, I, I, it means a lot to me. I really admire you and I like you a whole lot. So I was more than, more than excited to be able to talk with you. Thank you. Uh, two things, the top 10 is top TOP and then the number one zero mm-hmm. top 10 manager. So it's not T E N it's one zero. Correct. And then, uh, if they go and buy my book, I don't even care if you buy it from a reseller. I didn't write the book. And even though it became a wall street journal bestseller, I did not write the book to make money out of it. Uh, I wrote it to help people. So if you go there, I don't even care if you buy it from a reseller for half the price then you buy it from me. You send me an email at David Long at myemployees.com and you say, I bought your book. Please, you know, send me and put your, your Amazon uh, invoice number in there that you paid to buy the book and send me an email and I will send you the Kindle version of my book and the workbook I wrote to help people maximize what they learn from the book. I'll mm. send it to you for free. Thank you. Just to help people. Thank you. Yeah. It's top one zero top ten yeah, one top zero manager.com <laughs> exactly so thank you david really appreciate it thank you my friend what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walk through the fire came out better on the other side see life's like a peach if you find the same right now i'm feeling like a hundred grand